and thank you very much for the invitation to participate in tonight's seminar. Those of you who have, like me, been travelling the weary years of this war through this annual seminar series will no doubt be as relieved, relieved as I am that we're into the final year. However, to those in the front line, the opening months of 1918 looked nothing like the final year of war, far, oops, I didn't press that, far less of a victorious war. I've been asked to provide a brief overview of the events known to history as the German March Offensives, or the Kaiserschlacht, apologies for those who speak German, Imperial or Emperor's Battle, and put the, into context those calamitous events. Put simply, and as you can deduce from the slide, the Kaiserschlacht was all about manpower, with subordinate themes of opportunity and timing. By 1918, manpower was becoming a serious issue on both sides of the line. For the Allies, the loss of the Russian hordes was counterbalanced by the entry of the Americans. For the Germans, who, un who understood this reality just as well as the French and the British, America's demonstrated unpreparedness for the war provided a brief window of opportunity to strike a decisive blow before the Americans arrived in overwhelming numbers. Although the US had declared war on Germany in April 1917, they had only managed to send four infantry divisions to France by December of that year. The Russian collapse, on the other hand, had provided the Germans with over 80 capable combat experienced divisions to shift west and outnumber the, the struggling old allies before the Americans arrived. It's perhaps fortunate for the Allies that inept German political and strategic decision making, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, for example, was so severe that the Germans had to leave large numbers of troops in the east to ensure compliance with its terms. This strategic decision making meant that only 33 divisions of that 80 could be released to the Western Front. A number of others also had to be sent to Italy to shore up their Austro-Hungarian allies. But 52 German divisions were left in Russia and in February 1918 launched a police action against the defeated Russians, presumably to enforce law and order to try and impose some of the peace treaty sanctions, although the treaty wasn't signed until March. Even so, the Germans had 194 divisions, over three and a half million men on the Western Front at the beginning of March 1918. Both sides understood that the Germans would seek to exploit the opportunity provided by their new resources and seek to do so early before they became irrelevant in the face of American numbers, which is why, contrary to a lot of popular commentary, the Kaiserschlacht was not a strategic surprise to the Allies. The Allies also had their own internal political issues directly affecting frontline troop numbers. From January to March, the Allied armies were still restructuring and reforming after cataclysmic struggles and losses of 1917. The French, for example, for political reasons, had to send six divisions to Italy at the end of 1917, while another three of their frontline divisions had to be broken up to bring the remainder up to strength. For the first time since 1914, and I hesitate to be precise about numbers with Elizabeth sitting in the audience, the French had had only 100 divisions on the Western Front in January 1918, and most of these could only field around 6,000 infantry. The British Army also faced a manpower crisis. The number of replacements sent to the Western Front between November 1917 and February 1918 was artificially constrained to less than half the number available and needed. The government and Lloyd George in particular used to be blamed for this, but recent research suggests it was a deliberate policy of the Chief of the General Staff himself and the War Office. In the face of insufficient replacements and the need to keep the number of divisions constant, constant all British brigades were reduced by one battalion. The troops saved were then used to either supplement the existing battalions or to be converted to pioneers, a capability the British were seriously lacking in. Other domestic issues, for instance the need to keep industry functioning and the needs of the other fronts meant that over 115 battalions from the divisions on the Western Front were disbanded between February and March 1918 to the detriment of overall BEF combat effectiveness. Manpower shortages also led to other less desirable solutions including a broader base conscription process and dram dram dramatically lowered enlistment standards. As this slide shows, neither side was averse to recruiting children to maintain numbers, although the Germans went about it in a more systemic manner. You can see the, the guys in your top left are British recruits in January 1918, and the three chaps in the bottom right are three German prisoners of war captured during the height of the March offensive. I don't think any of them look over 16. Manpower may have been the headline issue, but there were, of course, other factors encouraging the Germans to launch an early offensive. 
The British convoy system had largely neutralised the German submarine campaign threatening British national survival. The same could not be said of the Allied blockade that was slowly but surely starving the Germans into submission. Not only was Germany running short of food, it was rapidly running out of horses, fodder, petrol, oil, rubber, and somewhat surprisingly, iron and steel. While Russia represented a potential supply source for some of these critical resources, its capacity to provide actual relief quickly was still very limited in early 1918. Even repairing and exploiting the Romanian oil fields was not completed until August 1918. Germany was starving and her citizens had almost had enough. The German economy had been taken over by the military and there was little sympathy for the needs of the civilian population. The German high command, however, appeared to forget that soldiers had families. Frontline morale was seriously affected by the domestic situation in Germany. Added to this was growing military and civil unrest, helped by a significant number of German soldiers returning from the Eastern Front, or from Russia, as the German High Command itself put it, infected by the ideas of the communist revolutionaries. A quick German victory was needed to overcome all of these domestic worries. Equally worrying was the development of an effective Allied offensive capability that looked to dominate German defensive methods. In stark contrast to the popular assessment of the Passchendaele campaign, the German High Command recognised that Messines, Vimy Ridge, the many separate battles of Passchendaele and of course Cambrai were clear evidence that British offensive doctrine had so developed that it threatened to overcome all the defensive lessons encapsulated in the formidable Hindenburg Line, uh, named after the gent in the centre with the fetching facial hair. Uh, that development plan, uh, that development, plus the fact Allied morale had surprisingly survived the test of 1917 reasonably well, meant that the Germans really had no option other than one last lightning strike to try and win the war. They could no longer look to strong defence merely to wear down Allied resolution. With the Russians clearly defeated, Ludendorff had begun planning an offensive using these released reserves as early as August 1917. It was refined as the Passchendaele campaign was winding down in late 1917, and the final decision to launch the attack was made on the 21st of January 1918. The return of their eastern divisions gave the Germans, for the first time since 1916, sufficient divisions to both hold the full length of the line in some strength and create an assault formation with sufficient mass to mount a uh, major attack with a likelihood of a probability of success. Experiments with new tactics, such as the so-called so stormtrooper infiltration method, had been positive when tried in Italy in late 1917. Uh, the slide shows German stormtroopers practicing air cooperation in early 1918. The Germans reclassified their Western divisions into two classes. The poorer, less capable ones were designated trench divisions and were responsible for defending fixed positions of the line, while the better ones, designated attack divisions, and I won't attempt the German, were pulled from the line, rested, reinforced with the best troops available, issued new equipment, including some, the revolutionary new MP18 Bergmann submachine gun, and man portable flamethrowers and put through a rigorous new training regime. They were trained to infiltrate, bypass strong points, and keep pushing through into the rear areas. Their aim was not to take the front line, but to disrupt command and control and cut off tactical supply to the front line defenders by operating in the lines of, of communication. Ludendorff had developed multiple options for his assault, but on the 21st of January, he put to Hindenburg the three most compelling. These were Operation George, a mass attack through Flanders, Operation Mars, an assault in the Vimy Arras area, and Operation Michael, a thrust through the old Somme battlefields. You will note from the map that only one of these was used initially. All of these were aimed at the British Army, as Ludendorff judged them to be the more vulnerable of the two Allied armies as a result of the Passchendaele and Combray losses. German High Command initially opted for Michael, a strike against the British Third and Fifth Armies. It had the added attraction of including within its objectives the major rail hub of Amiens. After penetrating the British line, the Germans were to swing northwest and cut the British off from their major supply source, but more importantly, from the French army. However, as the map also shows, additional German fences were later launched when the preceding ones either bogged down or failed outright. Operation Georgette was a cut down variation to one of Ludendorff's original concepts, unsurprisingly, the Operation George. Failing to, main the original aim, failing to maintain the original aim was one of the critical contributions to the overall failure of the Kaiserslag. In addition, new ideas began to subtly, subtly alter the original plan. 
such as Hindenburg's desire to shut down the Allied rail network to prevent lateral reinforcement. This wish in part underpinned both Operation Georgette and Operation Bruca. As well as new infantry tactics, the legendary German master artillerist, Colonel Georg Bruckmüller, who I don't have to describe to this audience, was directed to devise new methods to support the new storm techniques. His major idea was to increase significantly the ratio of gas to high explosive in the initial bombardment, and particularly against dispersed targets like artillery. The German air service also devoted much planning to achieving temporary air control of the skies over the battlefield. Even Germany's limited and distrusted by the High Command, embryonic tank corps were brought into this plan. Operational Michael began at 4.40 a.m. on the 21st of March, I, what, a day ago, or today, what's the day? Anyway, not long ago, with a five-hour shattering barrage from, and I know gunners get excited about this, 6,473 guns, 3,532 mortars. Five hours later, and fortuitously assist, assisted by a thick fog, 43 divisions of the German 2nd and 18th Armies attacked the 19 divisions of General Goff's British 5th Army, while a further 19 divisions from the 17th Army attacked General Bing's British 3rd Army. German artillery had thrown British com communications into chaos, while German gas had neutralised the bulk of the British defending artillery. By emphasising gas too, the Germans had avoided cratering the forward zone, which allowed their infantry to move much more quickly and assuredly. The forward defence lines vanished and the 5th Army began to rout. That's a scene taken on the 24th of March uh, behind, uh, in behind, and the name's gone out of my head, not far from um, Peron. Come, you can see the chalk uplands of the, the Somme Plateau, of the Sancre Plateau. I don't have any time to analyse in depth just why the Germans were so successful. I'm happy to do that in questions if you wish. But the common view that the British High Command simply dropped the ball is both erroneous and defamatory. However, there is also no question that confusion and some panic in the senior command chain, plus a severe loss of situational awareness across the whole battlefield, did play to the Germans' strengths. On the first day, they drove the British back nearly 20 kilometres. Although German losses were high, they consistently exceeded German, uh, British losses. They pressed on with Michael until he was finally held by desperate defence at Villers Bretonneux on the 4th and 5th of April. While the performances of the Australian 9th Brigade and the British 14th and 18th Divisions in stopping the advancing Germans cannot be underestimated, it is clear that Operation Michael had run out of puff by then anyway. The infantry were exhausted, the artillery and transport were left to the rear. Shows you why the artillery was left behind, oh, why the transport was left behind. While the medical system had failed. Many German troops had stopped to gorge on the contents of Allied supply dumps and many more had succumbed to the temptation of stock bars and wine cellars. Michael was essentially finished before the Australians and the British stopped them outside Amiens. While this would be a logical point to pass on to my colleague, the next speaker, who's going to talk about uh, villers bretonneux there's more to the Kaiserschlag than simply Operation Michael. And while Michael itself was considered, initially at least, a success, many of the fringe battles fought during it were, were complete losses by the Germans. And this, these losses exposed their extending flanks to attacks from the rapidly recovering British and, the, the, and more significantly, the arriving French forces. Ludendorff added to the problem, as I alluded to earlier, by making significant changes to his plan while the battle was in progress, adding new objectives and directing troops away from the single line of advance. Inevitably, the German progress slowed and eventually halted, forcing Ludendorff to devote divert troops away from sustaining Michael and to initiate new attacks to try and maintain the operational initiative. Even before formally halting Michael, he launched a revised version of George, Operation Georgette, in the Lys River area, south of Armin, uh, Armentiers, while committing, which committed an already overstretched German army to another mobile, massive mobile operation. And then on 28th of April, he compounded the problem by launching Operation Mars against Arras. The latter was an immediate and costly failure. Other massive offences were launched later against the French and the Americans further south, including one, Operation Blücher, that, by threatening Paris, galvanised an already aggressive French army into major and significant attacks. Indeed, the French and the American repulse of the Germans at track in the Soissons area in July, with the associated ferocious counterattacks that launched on the fringes, is arguably the true start of the final collapse of the German army, rather than the much more famous Battle of the 8th of August at Amiens. All these new initiatives, offensives merely served to increase the number of enemy that the Germans were facing, served to dilute the strength of the main tack 
and, and, and inevitably relieved the pressure on the retreating British, which eventually allowed the Allies to avoid the decisive defeat that, uh, that Ludendorff was seeking. Despite inflicting 178,000 casualties on the British and 70,000 casualties on the French, Operation Michael alone had cost the Germans about 250,000, mainly among their elite troops. The Allies could have... Well, I'm in front of you, sir. I'm nearly finished. <laughs> the Allies could afford to lose them. The Germans could not. As I said, the Kaiserslautern was all about manpower. Thank you very much.